you have stepped into Reader's Labyrinth. And here is your host, Frank Shumpert. Hey there, if you're watching this on YouTube, please give it a like and hit that subscribe button. It helps me reach a wider audience. Thanks for stopping by. Hello and welcome to Reader's Labyrinth. I am Frank Shumpert, your host. If you are listening on the podcast, welcome. And if you are watching on the YouTube, welcome as well. I have Sora Narnia. He is the creator and author of the Knife Point Horror, as well as the snowy nights you read to me, they'll never be forgotten. My personal favorite. And I would like to welcome him for round five into the labyrinth. You guys can check out my previous interviews I did with Soren and the link in the show notes below. What you are about to listen or watch today is myself and Soren Narnia. We purchased a copy of a book called The Nest. And we are about to do a book review of The Nest. There it is. He is holding it up for us. Dun, dun, dun. And let me tell you what, Soren has a whole lot to say about it. So if you stick around, you will receive my opinions on The Nest as well as Soren Narnia's opinion. And also, some of the folks from Reddit will be getting a shout out, as well as the artist Mandy Brown from Chapel Hill, North Carolina, because we had some of Soren Narnia's fans submitted some questions for me to ask him. So after about a month or so of collecting these questions, I've managed to whittle them down to about 15 or 18 questions. And oh boy, I can't wait to hear what Soren has to say. So stick around for that. You will not be disappointed. I'm doing good. Looking forward to talking about one of the greatest works of literature uh, of all time, I believe. I think we are uncovering a work of Shakespeare, aren't we? I'm so excited. Pretty much, pretty much, (laughs) pretty much, pretty much. (laughs) So for all of our viewers and listeners, uh, me and Sora Narnia, we have sat down and we have selected, although he's going to try and blame me for being the one that have um, selected the work that we are about to talk about, The Nest. This isn't about blame, Frank. It's not about blame. <laughs> it's about recrimination. But not <laughs> it's about recrimination. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so um, for those of you who are blessedly unfamiliar, me and Sora Narnia, we sat down a couple months ago for an interview and Soren had the great idea. Hey, let's select some books that were released seventies and eighties because that was kind of a magic time for some of the pulp dime novel, just horrendous books for people to read. And one of those books that were, that was released in, let's see, in 1985 is a book called the nest. And it is by an author named Gregory Douglas, who wrote most of his work under the pen name of Eli Cantor. And I would, yep, and he is holding up a copy of his magnum opus right here, The Nest. And I want everyone to see on The Nest that cover. That's why when the paperback's from hell, that's it right there. There's the guy an artist rendition of an evolutionary offshoot that is an offshoot of a termite of a hive mind of cockroaches. That's it right there. I think we can stop the interview now. Everyone knows what it is. The giant cockroaches are upon us. But the um, original author, his name is, uh, well, it's Gregory Douglas. He studied philosophy. So he's a man after my own heart. Studied philosophy at New York University. He ended up earning a law degree. So studied philosophy, graduated um, NYU, and he began to work in the legal department of CBS television. But by night, he was pursuing his true passion. He was putting on his superhero costume, sitting at his typewriter and just banging out short stories. He began selling his short stories to some pulpy short story anthologies and finally sold his very first novel, The Nest, which I would like to add was made into a movie in 1988. 
And some of the good people on YouTube has told me that that movie is something of a cult following. So that should be something to look at if you think about it. I'm going to hold the rating of the book till after we talk about it too. So I'm going to let you know what my final thoughts are. But to give us a very brief synopsis of The Nest, it, ta um, it takes place on an island town of Yarki off of Cope Cod. And I'm assuming by the context of the uh, novel that we're looking at the late 70s or early 80s. And now my favorite part, the precipitating event. The island has a giant stinky landfill, which seemed to be kind of common in the background of a lot of writing during this time. I know that um, Stephen King's Salem's Lot had a giant, you know, burning landfill. I know that uh, Peter Straub also had some landfills in his. Um, Clive Barker later in the 90s. It, it, you know, I, I don't know what it is about the landfill. I wonder if it was um, an ecological awareness or something. But they were treating some uh, pesticides on the landfill. And the chemicals, those chemicals ended up having a Godzilla effect on the roaches. They got super big. Their evolutionary mutations were accelerated across thousands of generations till they had the giant cockroach, probably about as big as this, maybe a little bit bigger. That's it right there. Soren Arnia is currently working on a 3D model of the cockroach, <laughs> which he will have on, e on eBay. He will be offering uh, bids for it, but that's it. So, as you can imagine, the town of Yarki, it, it kind of follows your typical monster movie stuff. It's an isolated town. You can't really escape the town. And there's a monster that's loose, in this case, of cockroaches. So that's kind of our setup. And I would go over the characters, but uh, if my listeners and viewers have read the books themselves, that would account going through about 10 or 20 people, so... With that, I will let Soren step in and uh, add his two cents here. Yeah, I was actually um, very, well, strangely excited to read this book because I, I had read the, um, the book called Paperbacks from Hell by Grady Hendrix, in which he gave you know, like a really great historical overview of this uh, era in publishing and the whys and wherefores. The book includes all these great covers and synopses of these novels. And uh, so the... Uh, there was a reprint because the book was did so well, a reprint of several of these, of which The Nest is one for mere $16 mass market paperback. And I thought, yeah, why not? Why not? I never as a kid really got into reading these, but the, the covers just fascinated me. I thought that that looks like the scariest, scariest thing ever. And what I do really like about this reprint, recent reprint, is that I don't know if you can do this with paperbacks today, but this has in the back the little listing of their other titles complete with a little cutout order form that you can use just like in the seventies and eighties. And I never did that. I'm so mad. I never actually cut out the little thing in the back of the paperback and sent it away with a self-addressed stamped envelope. But you can do that with uh, at the end of the nest. But I would say that if you like this cover, I mean, it's, it's, this is literally what you're getting you're getting this level of sort of B-movie literature, except it's written, this guy, Gregory Douglas, you can tell that he was a he was a smart professional writer who was slumming it probably for, for money. And the book really has that aura about it from beginning to end. So you're, you're sort of cringing in parts, thinking, oh, this is so bad. But, and at the same time, he obviously did a lot of plotting, a lot of planning. And then to me, this book actually kind of got better uh, toward the end because here comes some really cool science stuff about these giant roaches and how it would work and, and their capabilities and the, their origin. And it may be junk science for all I know, but it was, it, of course, the secret as a writer is you just have to be one step ahead of the reader. So I was convinced that this was actual science and there's a lot of it in the book. So even though you have all the cringeworthy stuff like, um, you know, ridiculous romantic subplot you got a couple of terrible sex scenes. You have ridiculously over the top gore, which is clearly written just to provoke, just to, <laughs> there's no, no call for it being this nasty in parts. Um, so if that's what you want, the nest is, is, is there to give it to you. And uh, it was never to me uh, an unskilled 
piece of writing. Some of the language was a little bit odd to me, but I think this guy knew exactly what he was doing. He went for it and you could do worse, frankly. That's a good, um, a good observation because just kind of looking at my notes here, I think on every single page of my notes, I have something about bug science that's written down. And when I was reading the cover of it, it said that the author, uh, Gre Gregory Douglas, that he actually sat down and he spoke to a sociobiologist, E.O. Wilson. And I looked him up in Wikipedia and apparently he's kind of a famous scientist. You know, he's a big bug guy himself. Now, like you said, um, whether or not he spoke to them and it's all junk science and he just kind of, you know, took some of their, their verbiage and worked it in, it's to be seen. But, um, but the bug science part really helped to kind of add some atmosphere to the novel. And uh, there, there was a scene in there, <clears throat> excuse me, where, for lack of a better term, the main char character, I guess, Dr. Hub Hubbard, when they were in the lighthouse, and all the characters are gathered around and he's kind of telling them what his theory on the roaches are. So, so at this point we've had some gratuitous sex scenes. We've had some death. There's been a buildup and the novel has kind of shown you the perspective of the roaches, but now you have the perspective of the humans and he kind of goes into like the evolutionary nature of thought and consciousness. And I'm not sure if that is part of Douglas, his philosophy, you know, kind of coming in there and, um, I'm not going to say that the nest explores the nature of consciousness, but what's interesting is that the bugs have a type of epistemology that comes out in the actual writing itself, like how they react to stimulus, how they react to the humans, how they react to a perceived threat and the humans do as well. So the book actually pulled that, that part off. Now, if you are actually a cockroach scientist or for lack of a better term, um, I'm quite sure that you could point out to us the many, many shortcomings, but as a way to suspend belief, build atmosphere, and just keep me turning the page, I thought it did really, really well. And something that you brought up, Soren, is you were talking about how the book set out to accomplish the mission, and it did just that. And I'm wondering if that mission was set by the editor. Hey, we want it to be this long. Because it seems like the story could have ended right after the children were massacred on the island. Because the roaches are eliminated, I want to say, in two chapters after that. But there's about three or four more chapters where the story just keeps going and going. And I'm like, what are you doing? It's just... Um... But anyway, that's my observation about the bug science. So. Yeah, you could almost uh, sense that there was, there was an editorial checklist for this kind of novel at this time period they want to sell X amount of copies, and here's the formula. And I think the author was exactly. willing to give them that formula. He just went a little bit above and beyond with, with the science, frankly. And I was, and there's just so much of it. There's there's fun images, um, fun imagery about uh, how all these these bugs are maybe creating this sort of. They're all individual cells in a great in a bigger hive. That's what they're working toward. It, that's a good thing. I think the other thing that, that, that I kind of liked about the book is that. You, you mentioned the children's massacre. This, this book is willing to kill characters that maybe you weren't expecting to die in such horrible ways. Sometimes there are people who think, oh, they're, they're going to get out of this. And they do not. That's they true. do yeah. not. Uh, and I did like that. I thought, oh, okay, well, I was expecting this scene to end with them squeaking out of it. But um, the author had, had some other ideas. And I, 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 was, I was impressed by that sometimes. I was too. Um, yeah, the uh, nest, it will subvert your expectations because that's what we say about every single writing now. It subverts the expectations. You know, I, I, you know, I almost kind of wonder if Gregory or Greg, whatever he went by, if he got about halfway through and he realized, he's like, wait a minute, I've got 15 characters. You know, I've got 12 or 15 characters. I'm just going to kill them all. Let's see here. I was going to do something with, you know, the female bi biologist plot. Nah, I'm not going to do anything with that. I changed my mind. And this deputy, we don't need him. And so it just started hacking them all to pieces. So Good for him. That was good for him, I say, because it, it, made right. a, it made a fairly predictable story with all the boilerplate elements a little bit more unpredictable. So I, I'm in Oh, for sure. So I would invite you, Soren, to open up your book to page 78. 
78, oh, my goodness. man. Here we go. Dun, 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 dun. Yes. If yes. I didn't think YouTube would uh, zap me for playing music, I would play some music. Which all the music that you hear on Reader's Labyrinth is music I've produced in my little garage band. So watch out. Either that or Kevin Incompetech, however you pronounce his name. Yeah, all right. Good guy. So I am looking at his lovely overuse of descriptors at work. The scene before her, too plain in the flickering moonlight, was beyond the worst um, imaginings of even a Hieronymus Bosch, fouler than the most infernal depths of satanic demons. For me right there, this is the writing that will encapsulate the nest because his descriptors will just kind of follow one like uh, one another. Um, the flickering moonlight, okay? Worst imaginings. Okay, that's bad. But he's going to throw a metaphor at me of Hieronymus Bosch. I'm like, okay, scary stuff. Fouler than the most infernal depths of satanic demons. Like, you, I mean, it's almost like a Dr. Seuss book. Like, I mean, he has to like almost make, make it kind of like a rhyming meter or something to it. <laughs> really, really enjoyed that. I, I didn't know if there was another passage there, Soren, if you particularly, if you picked something up from that. Yeah, I I know that we uh, talked about like you find a found a passage that just stood out for for better or for worse, and that actually was one of ones I picked. But then I did I did find another one, and I don't even need to give it any context whatsoever. I'll just start by saying that gagging with nausea, the three Yarky stalwarts watched the fantastic repugnant sight. The first roach went directly for the rabbit's eyes. The men heard the click of the breaking cornea as the insect mandibles pressed in. They saw the gush of liquid from the eyeball as the panicked rabbit chittered with the pain. They watched what they could not believe. The great cockroach insinuated itself quickly into the rabbit's eye socket, obviously eating its way through right on into the brain. Then the insect body vanished entirely while the men looked on. You know, if that's what you want, hello. It's right it's, it's there, in there. Guys, it's in there. It. I would say about uh, there's about six or seven scenes like that where he's he's obviously kind of trying to top himself, and uh, why not? Now, if it were a movie, and I did watch some of the movie, by the way. Um, oh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. 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 There's no need to even discuss it. But <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> um, if it were a movie, I would I would kind of start oh. uh, you know laughing. It's, it's just too much, but I can, I can take it in prose. I can take gore in prose. I can't take it in watching movies anymore it freaks me out but um it's it's almost just darkly funny on the page what, what he's doing here i love it and um on page uh let's see on page 108 and again um so I, i'm not really going to go and read it but um i really enjoyed again which i kind of referenced earlier was the scene between dr hubbard and dr lindstrom uh, when they were sitting around and they were discussing the roaches and their evolution. And it brought to mind the imagery that I saw. Well, the first time I saw was John Carpenter's movie, The Thing. And this was after the dog kennel scene. And they were gathered in the in the examination room. And this was before they were figuring out what it was. But Dr. Weir was explaining to all the men of the team, hey, you know, this isn't a dog. This is an imitation. And just that oppressive atmosphere in that scene in John Carpenter, just the sheer terror of what was coming. And I, I kind of got a lot of those same vibes in that scene. So that scene right there kind of saved the novel for me because anything else after that, I, I was able to laugh at it or I was able to forgive it. So, and kind of get through the book after that. But Yeah. I love, I love any scene in a, in a book or a movie where the scientist sets everyone down and here comes the explanation of what they're up against because you've kind of seen it maybe you don't really understand it and here here's the smart person laying it all out to a room full of like really freaked out human beings uh that's a great scene there should even be like a name for it in in, in horror horror fiction and horror cinema like what is that scene called like the the explanation so. of what's going yeah, on yeah i, I always yeah, think no. Always dig it. Well, I mean, you know, it, it kind of harkens back to like some. Sorry about that. There's a fly. <laughs> Jeez, that's like it's taunting me. But um, you know, it, it kind of harkens back to like a primal form of storytelling, 
where it's like, you know, the warriors are gathered around the campfire. Everyone has their spears out and there's a monster that, that's in the darkness. And um, I think that kind of like awakens something like those elements of the campfire can be found in really, really good storytelling. And I always appreciate it whenever I run across it. As a matter of fact, one of the books that I'm reading for an author and who I'm going to be having on my show, he pulls that off very, very well. In fact, there's a flavor of that in almost every single scene in there. And that's one of the things I really appreciate about him. But um, on page 224, and you don't have to turn to it, it's okay. Um, the roach colony is developing a hive mind. And um, I was thinking, I was like, I guess the hive mind insect thing was a cliche even back then. Like, I kind of thought that the whole hive mind thing was something that had developed from... Um, Frank Herbert's novel, Hellstrom's Hive, which um, to my knowledge, he was one of the first ones to kind of take the whole bug thing, but um, which that is a, a terrible novel. <laughs> I mean, I love Frank, <laughs> Frank Herbert. I, I love his doom, but oh my gosh, Hellstrom's Hive was just, um, it was almost nest level stuff, but I guess, hey, you know, everyone has to make a living. But the whole concept of the hive mind, um, I thought it was pulled off pretty good in here. And again, you know, just kind of goes back to like some of the bug sciencey kind of stuff. So, yeah. And, and uh, the scene where they're talking about the hive mind and the other scenes, what it does, it, it tends to create more vivid imagery in your mind than even the chase scenes or the gore scenes. And all you're, all, all he's really describing is a person in a room speaking these things. And yet you get the imagery. And they're talking oh, about the do. hive mind. Yeah, you can yeah. see it. You can kind of see this this thing in your mind. It's like, yeah, there's the, the author didn't really have to do anything but put words, some dialogue, into a character's mouth, and it works. It works as well. It's still still in my mind, you know, um, more than more so than most of the novel. So. Yeah, yeah, it was definitely a very <coughs> sorry. It was definitely a very effective uh, device that he was using in there, and um. One of my favorite parts in it was when he was describing the hive, like whenever one of the roach armies, I guess, was annihilated by the humans. And he describes the mound, like a mound of cockroaches that's like pulsating and moving and how there were guard co cockroaches that was guarding the entrance. And it, I mean, it, it was, um, his, his descriptors were just over the freaking top. I definitely would, wouldn't, wouldn't advise eating anything whenever you read this. So Yeah, no. <laughs> and of course, some of it was, uh, you know, his decision to do the old, um, let's switch to the bugs point of view a couple times. Oh, yeah, yeah. Which, man, that is so tough to pull off. And he, he's, you know, and it's about as ridiculous as, as you would think, sort of getting in the mind of the cockroaches and how they think and, you know, putting lots of things in italics and exclamation points. It's completely, completely absurd. <laughs> Absurd and lovely at the same time. So I would like to talk about how, you know, a rating out of 10, 10 being just awesome. I have to tell the world about this book. One is the book needs to be burned. So Soren, where do you fall on this? What rating would you give this book? Oh, you know, I'm going to, I'll just slap a slap a five on it uh, because it's, you know, it's, it, it's, it gives you what the cover promises. Nothing more, nothing less. Maybe, you know, maybe a little more, actually. Maybe there are a couple of surprises just when you think you're ready to write the, the book off because it's it's just, you know, it's, it's very cheesy and B-movie-ish. Maybe it'll kind of catch you by surprise in, 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 a, in a couple of ways. But there are, I think there are probably um, more effective uh things in this in this kind of shame uh, same genre from the same time period i'm not sure what they are they're out there somewhere the book is a little bit long like you were saying for what it is we have this sort of extra extra ending um but you know if it's summer you got nothing to do and you have that um and if, and you, if you're down for this if you're the kind of person who is down for this uh you're gonna get maybe not 16 dollars worth but you're gonna get something out of the nest I think you will. So five out of 10 for Soren Narnia. That's awesome. For me, you know, I was thinking long and hard about this. I'm going to have to give it a six out of 10. I'm going to have to go one up. 
And so um, the best way I can explain it is I'm going to explain why I, I initially was going to give it a five. The first reason is everything that, that you were just saying. The cover is what you get. Nothing more and nothing less. And maybe a little bit more because you keep turning the page. The second reason I gave it a five is because I generally had a creepy feeling after reading it. I mean, I would do like the brush off is what I would do. I was like, oh my gosh, what's that? I think I saw a, a cockroach or two, so which I made fun to smash them up. So there is a little part where out of the corner of my eye, I, I would think I saw a roach or something. So the writing itself kind of sank into a part of my mind that I didn't really expect it to be able to go. So definitely a solid five. And I'm going to give it a six because I think I know where this book could fit in really, really well. So when I was growing up, my father used to, well, I guess force me and my brother to go to work with him when he opened up his own business. And my father worked on aircraft. So this was a maintenance FBO. And I was kind of raised around air, aircraft and airports my whole life. But when I was in the break room, there used to be just stacks of books like The Nest. I mean, books from um, Stephen King, from Clyde Barker, but also just these unknown pulpy a book that would be laying in, you know, the work bathroom and it would have aircraft grease all over the wall. And there'll be this worn copy of a book that has a skeleton with a flag on it or something. And I was thinking to myself, you know what? If I was still working at the airport, I would leave a copy of it in the break room. And I bet that if I went back there six months later, it would be gone. Someone would, someone would put it in their aircraft with them when they have a long flight somewhere someone would pick it up and it would travel with them. And that story would still be out in the wild. So I thought to myself, Absolutely. there is a place for them. Yeah, there's a place for it. And someone would see the cover. They would go through all the nasty sex scenes would probably have, have an earmark on the page. <laughs> and uh, But the story <laughs> would have a life in the wild. It would definitely have a life in the wild somewhere. So. I could kind of yeah, see I think it, you're right. You know? I don't know. If, do you know the, the concept of the little free library? We have um, we have these everywhere where I live and other towns where you're just walking through a neighborhood and, and there's like a little wooden post. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, it's a little, little birdhouse and that's where people put their the books that they don't want anymore and you're free to come up and just take one. I guarantee you, if I put the nest in any little free library in America, that thing will be gone yeah. in in, tw in 24 hours. It just I was has that. Say, there's, yeah. There's yeah. two free li libraries in our neighborhood, and, and they're both for like kids. And I was thinking of slipping my copy of the nest in there. Yeah, here, here well, you, you go, know the, <laughs> the sex scenes are so ridiculous; it probably won't even corrupt them much. And um, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they're very, well, they're very. It's probably tame. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, they're you know they're they're probably tame scenes, you know, compared to some of the stuff that's out there. Heck, some of the stuff that you can just find on YouTube. I mean. Yeah, and yeah. YouTube is supposed so to be I, edited. I think that, that may be what I do with with my copy of of the nest. I may go down to the little free library and um, the one that uh, I walk past every day, and see how long it takes to to vanish. I bet you it won't be long. And and there, yeah, there's. I bet you this could. I bet you I have a feeling this is some people's favorite book, because it, so it, depending too. on yeah, depending yeah. on the time of life that you you catch this at, um. You know, it, it probably checks all the right boxes in, in, in all the right ways. So as a as a novel, as a piece of writing, you know, not so much. But as a thing called the nest with a big mutant cockroach on the cover and a full moon. You know, you didn't have to do that. that. That's a little bonus, the full moon to make it extra spooky as as that thing that exists in this world. I say bravo. Same here. And the world would would be less of it if there wasn't the nest. It would be so much. I can't even imagine a world without without the nest. I, I just can't. <laughs> well, Soren, I will let you have the final word on this. Is there anything you would like to tell the listeners or viewers? Well, I just like to say it was just an ordinary garbage dump on peaceful Cape Cod. Uh, no one ever imagined that conditions were perfect for breeding, that it was a warm womb, fetid, moist, and with food so plentiful that everything creeping, crawling, and slithering could gorge to satiation. That's all I have to say, Frank. That's all I have to say. And if they want to hear the rest, then they can, they too, they too can get a copy of the book from, um, what is it? Is it Paperbacks from Hell? 
I think that's yeah, the yeah, website. Available at your, at your local sell. Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> Sixteen right. bucks. That's it. Plus shipping. Plus shipping. I think I got about nineteen dollars. I had to spend on it. Oh, oh, about nineteen. Yeah. Well, Soren, thank you for showing up and telling us about the nest. And for our readers and viewers out there, me and Soren are on the lookout for a book. So if you have a book you would like for us to review, so long as it is fun to read, as long as it rises to the level of the nest, because the nest has set the standard is what it's done. We cannot go below yeah, a five. Yeah, I don't know about like now, reading so. like actual literature. That said, that to me has uh, very little allure <laughs> these days. So it could make it something, make yeah. it something you know, kind of tacky. Spicy. That's it. Yeah, spicy is what we're looking for. Thank you, Soren. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. All right. So, as promised, here are Knife Point Horror and Snowy Nights questions for the creator and writer and narrator Soren Narnia himself. Soren, are you ready for question one, sir? I am ready for the questions. Let's do it. The following questions are from Mandy Brown. Is Cleanse really about serial killers? Uh, to me, it is It is not so much about serial killers. No, I, I, I think it's just a guy who's who's repressing something and in that repression he goes so far out into his own reality that it becomes just utterly bizarre i i never want to never want to say no or yes to any specific interpretations because i believe the reader's interpretation is just as valid as mine but i as i wrote cleanse to me it was about him excellent Question number two, was a protagonist in Diggs caught in a time warp or maybe just the apartment complex? Good question. Uh, I think that ending, what we're seeing is there's some kind of warp situation going on. You can't quite prove it because all we do is we see a cat and we hear a knock at the door. It's not proof of anything quite, but I think the word warp is, it may be accurate. Time, I'm not sure, but some kind of reality thing has has bent for the poor guy. I think I think it has. Was pretty much everyone in drop ins dead? Uh to me the uh just good old grandma and the fellow we meet who had the, the, the bad ski trip. Um they are both they are both certainly dead the others i i don't i don't get that feeling i think they 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 live amongst us it's it's them versus the others yeah that almost makes it more creepy do you think winthrop did it winthrop from the lockbox you know, this is this is a good example of you know, I, I, I do tell people that there are certain mysteries of these stories that even I, I really don't know the truth. And I want to keep it that way because it, to me, that kind of draws me into the writing of it. I, I like to sort of go into the mystery as almost as far as I can, but then pull back. So when it comes to Winston, I think the evidence, the circumstantial evidence is not really in favor of, of my man, Winston. There's a lot going on with him. On the other hand, we have this woman, Vana, uh, who's got so many problems and has likely made so many enemies and so many dark connections that we don't even know about that maybe it was somebody else. I think if Winston did it, it he did it sort of as an act of, of defense against his friend, Ellen. And uh, of course, to me, the point of the lockbox is is that um, it, it almost doesn't matter if he did it or not because it, it's about Ellen's belief in him as a human being that she sees value in this in this tortured soul. The evidence leans toward guilty, but not all of it. There's there's something that tells me maybe maybe not. Were the prophetic marbles in family 
based on anything in particular, or did you just make that up? That was an invention because I, I got briefly interested in uh, these the random elements in fortune telling. For instance, the tarot deck is shuffled. It's a random or, or even reading tea leaves or chicken innards. Um, there's this random element. I thought that's that's kind of cool. Like what, what would that look like? What would a new cool way to or an ancient way that no one knows about of taking random elements and reading them? in a way that no one else can see. And I, I got this image of my mind of these, just these black marbles glinting in, a, in an overhead street lamp, skittering across the pavement. I, li I like that image um, and that stuck with me. So that was, that was an invention. Why are there so many laundry mats everywhere? Does something happen to you in a laundry mat, sleep, cleanse, et cetera? There are indeed, uh, I did a word search on all the stories of the last 10, 12 years. Uh, the person asking this question is correct. There's laundromats everywhere, even in, even in stories that I had, I had forgotten there were laundromat references. So I think, I think maybe I, had, I, I underwent just enough trauma from my decade or so of laundromat dependency you know, all that time, the, you know, everything in cleanse, every detail about the laundromat life is true. That's what cleanse is really about. <laughs> it's about how awful laundry truly is. So I, I think in the back of my mind, I'm always afraid because I, I managed to finally get a washer dryer in my unit. I'm just so terrified of, of slipping back, you know, because I, I don't trust myself. I don't know where I'm going in life. What happens if I have to start going back to the life where you're just dragging that giant bag all over town again? I think I have a real fear of that. I don't want to face that again. Perfectly understandable. I'm assuming you've played the Thousand Steps game from Tears of Sisyphus. Sorry, Sisyphus. Is that how you pronounce it? Uh, Tears of Sisyphus, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sisyphus. Okay, I always miss a syllable. Where's the weirdest place you've ever ended up because of it? Uh, yes, I've only played that game twice. I failed both times. Uh, in, in so what I really do instead, I, I have a game that I really like. Um, I don't have a name for it, but what I'll do is I, I drive out into like beyond the suburbs into what I think of as the exurbs where the land really begins to open up and I'll park the car and I'll just start walking uh, country roads, sometimes the side of the highway. And I try to make just a big, I, I take a guess using the GPS at a big square or a big circle, hoping that I'll get back in about two hours to my to my origin point. And I feel very pioneering and very Tom Sawyer-ish when I do this. Um, I haven't really come across too much interesting. I did one time go down the wrong access road and I, I kept going and going and I, I dead-ended at a huge concrete slab-like building that didn't seem to have any markings whatsoever. There was no gate, no, no protection. There's no cars around it, but there was a guy sitting in a folding chair just kind of leaned back against the building and he had a huge rifle slung over his shoulder. I don't know what he was waiting for. Was he waiting to be challenged? Was he waiting for someone like me to come down the road to blast me? What, what was in this, this building? I don't know. I don't know, but I turned tail and I, I walked away as soon as I saw the size of that rifle. It, it just did not seem right. It sounds like the beginning of a good story to me, Soren. So... Mm -hmm. Okay, is there any plan to reprint some of your books that are out of print? I know you offer PDFs of some, but hypothetically, what about those of us, not naming names, who have a dedicated shelf full of physical Soren Narnia books that we've highlighted and dog-eared and written notes into death and that we want to fill in all the holes, hypothetically? Hypothetically. Hypothetically. Well, I would say that if if a book of mine is not in print or it was taken out of print, that that means just from the creative aspect that I, I I wasn't really satisfied with some aspect of it, or I decided that the the audio version that that I kind of cohered from it was really to me the the defining version. So if it's out of print, that means that I myself has nothing. It's not a business decision at all. Of course, it's it's just me having 
thinking about that book and thinking, mm, no, I just, ah, there's some, I just, I don't think I nailed it. And either I'll retool it someday if I get the time, or maybe it is just kind of uh, part of part of the past, and I consider it uh, like a, a, a long, deep foul ball that that uh, I, I couldn't quite keep um, keep in the field. Okay, fair enough on that, definitely. So that ends the questions from Mandy Brown, and we are going to move on to some of the questions that have come to us from Reddit and the Facebook group. In fact, more than one Facebook group, I think, has sprung up. Question number one, what are you afraid of? Not existentially, I mean, are you scared of bugs, lightning, poorly cooked shellfish? Uh, I am not great with flying. It seems to be actually getting worse as I get older. Um, let's throw spiders in there. Uh, the weird one I think to me is I, I revolving doors. Um, I'm not afraid of them, but I always get a little bit tense because I don't think we have enough time to get in and out. We're just like, somebody's going to get squished. You know, you have, you have a split second to get in and out of that re fast moving revolving door. And I just, I always have it in the back of my mind that, that, that this is going to be the end that I'm going to die. I've never sh shaken that feeling. I'm kind of and the same I'm way. I'm the rational <laughs> one. <laughs> I'm kind of the same way when it comes to escalators. So I can kind of I have some empathy for you. Yeah. Well, escalators, they, there have been some incidents. There have uh -oh. been some incidents. You need to be Frank. quiet now. <laughs> yeah. Whenever people get pulled <laughs> under them. Also, what movies have scared you the most? Uh, Almost always when I, I really dig a horror movie and I really respect it, it's more, a, it's kind of like an intellectual appreciation. It's very, very rare, um, especially as I get older, that I, I feel that that genuine like shiver where I feel like really tense and uncomfortable. It has happened. Mm -hmm. I think The Exorcist did it to me. It, that whole movie just whomped me over the head uh, with with genuine fear. Um, something like, uh, you know, the Blair Witch Project really got to me. Uh, I, I was really like genuinely like, like this, um, parts of say, you know, the original Halloween or the original Salem's Lot miniseries when I was a kid, some of that, some of that really got me. Um, even, you know, the last 10 minutes of the evil dead, uh, are, are incidents that I think of these, these are things that like, I've really felt that visceral, stab just for at least just for a minute i'll, I'll say the end of uh, a movie that um i talked about recently uh skin of a rink toward the end oh. of that i i really felt okay, yeah. genuinely like wow i feel really creeped out right now the movie the howling is what did it for me and that's what caused me to get the book mm. <laughs> so so we have another question for you how do you come up with your stories it would be interesting to hear how your process goes from how the initial idea sparks to how you further develop it into a story. Concrete examples would be great and they are required. So. Man. Um, Tough crowd. Yeah. Usually it starts with, with a random image or uh, something incredibly small, some little tiny story idea I'm wondering about. And maybe it'll develop into like a three sentence concept. And then I think what I do a lot is I'll take it and I'll, I'll, I'll put it in a mental pot of boiling water and I'll try to boil out the tropes and the absurdity of like an absurd idea until the steam rises and all the, the, the absurdity leaves. And what's left is just this tiny little kernel, this core of what might actually be scary. So for example, um, a recent story I did called Colony. Something flipped past the TV set. I think it was the movie Grizzly from like 1977. I, I started to think, yeah, these 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 animals attack movies tend to just they just they can't do it. They they can't quite do it. Jaws did it masterfully, but there was that whole whole time in American cinema where just everyone was trying this animal attack concept, and it was always bad. It's just too difficult. You know, and that led to this this mental image of just these people sort of like in a, in a horse stables looking out at the woods because something is going to come out at them. And I thought, well, you know, there, there's something here. What, how do you do an animal attack story that 
on the surface is absurd. I can't make you believe this is real. I can't do the science. I can't, it's, it's too ridiculous, but how can I make it so that you believe that the characters believe it because they've been starved of information. They have, they have no choice but to, to act on the information that they have. Therefore, the ridiculousness of the premise is boiled away. And what is left, and this is, I think, what, is, what I do for most stories is just that seed of, of, of root terror that can kind of work. Because the, the, the secret is not, can I make you believe this stupid situation? The key is, can I make you feel for characters who have no choice but to believe it? And that's kind of that's kind of a similar process for for all the stories. Oh yeah, and uh, you know, as a longtime listener, I mean, I have to say that there's a primal element to your writing, and just you know, kind of hearing you kind of tell us about how you bake up these stories and you peel away the tropes, and like you're uncovering this primordial fear that arises out of the darkness, I guess. And like you said, the image of them looking into the darkness and there's animals in there, really, really powerful. And Colony is a wonderful, one of my all-time favorite stories as well. So another question for us, do you have an opinion on the perception that your stories have become less scary over time? Is this a deliberate choice or a natural, less conscious evolution as a writer? How much do you prioritize keeping the quote horror in knife point horror? Uh, I think that's a fair point. And I, I think there's just, there's a certain amount of creative restlessness that comes with doing this for so many years. And that initially the, the challenge for me was like, how can I write the scariest thing possible? And then over the years, like, well, I need, I need, I need to, I need to keep my mind playing. So I need to think, okay, what else can this genre do? What else can I write about? What other things can I write about to bring into the horror genre? And it's just, it's just me trying not to be so bored with myself. But I, I like to think that in the end, I, it is a conscious choice to try to slowly, even if months pass, to try to bring it back to a more, a more pure form of horror, because that, that is why a lot of people uh, are there. For, for, so for last year, uh, recently, a story like um, called Gifters, or the story I just uh, put out recently called Endgame was actually a conscious attempt to say, okay, let's let's get back to the creeps, the genuine the genuine creepiness, which I, I know people do respond to. So I, no matter how far I may stray to keep myself entertained and not make it feel like work, I will try to always come back and and give you give you a, a decent dose of, of of just pure gut horror from time to time. You know, I know that the listeners and watchers aren't, you know, they're not really too terribly interested in my opinion, but I think that, you know, the stories are, you, you know, I, I think that they are scary because I always kind of ask myself, okay, if I had to be in one of your stories, the main character, which one would it be? I can't think of any <laughs> other than the werewolf that's one, good, because, that's because that's pretty much the only one where your main character, where he got off scot-free. I mean, he got off pretty scot-free. He didn't see anything that was so terrible. It was scarring for life. It would always kind of cause him to question. And he would definitely not want to connect the dots when he's going to bed at night. But that was the only one where I was like, okay, in Bargain, the main character was able to get away scotch-free. But I, I don't think your main characters are able to go on with their life the way they were before. You know, I mean, especially, you know, probably seven out of ten of them, they are just, they are permanently changed forever by it. In their perception right. and their ability. And, and Bargain is actually a good example of what I was talking about, is that the the idea, the, the werewolf concept is essentially absurd. It, it, that's really tough to make truly plausible. So how do you how do you go about making it so that the absurdity of the werewolf idea doesn't matter? Because what the character goes through is just really scary. Uh, um, that's 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 what I what I what I try to do. Really, really cool story. One of my favorite. So do you like the idea of film adaptations of the stories? I know there are a few film versions and that the stories are open licensed, so the filmmakers don't have to acquire rights from you. But have you ever been approached about participating in a feature-length film, adaptation of any of the stories, or even an anthology-type series of several of them? 
uh, approached, yes. But the thing you have to remember is that, you know, in my little corner of the world, I have this um, very enviable amount of total creative freedom. I don't have to worry about marketing. I don't have to worry about budgets. I don't have to worry about what was a hit last week and trying to duplicate that. I don't care about current trends. All those stresses are taken away from me. So what you what you hear when you when you listen to one of these stories is you're just hearing what I thought was really good in the moment. And poor film producers have to worry about all that other stuff. That seems very stressful to me. So someone else is going to have to do all the heavy lifting if 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 they really want to <laughs> get some movies made because I, I I'm addicted to the the creative freedom that I have. But I you know I would pay I would pay. Tuesday morning matinee bargain pricing to see something on the big screen that I wrote. Absolutely. I, I would, I would like to watch it. I would like to put out into the universe that I hope that an anthology of knife point horror, you know, does get put out one day and I would love to be a part of that and kind of help that happen. And um, I think we need to keep Soren isolated somewhere and feed him some jelly beans and just have him write and we'll, isolate him off from the rest of the world. We will do his laundry too, to help make that happen. So, so yeah, moving I'd be on. perfectly delighted oh. if, 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 uh, yeah. you know, if, if it was just, if it was just, you know, um, enthusiastic people, enthusiastic amateurs a adapting things just for the love of, of doing it. I just think that's, that's great. Cause I consider myself like an enthusiastic amateur. And, uh, I think I think it's great that people just say, you know, I, th I think I will adapt bargain. I think I will adapt staircase. I'm just going to do it. That is very cool to me. Um, you know, not not expecting some grand reward just for the love of of creating. Someone needs to do an an adaptation of Impound. I think I would love to be a part of that. That's my all time fa favorite story so far, except for the one you have yet to write. That's probably going to be my next favorite one, but. So moving on to our next question here, do you prefer to voice over your own work or the works of others? Let's see, what's that asking, I guess? Oh, oh, okay, I get it, sorry. That makes sense. Yeah, uh, well, definitely my own because when I write, I know what I'm going for, but when I narrate someone else's, I don't really, I can't ever quite crawl into the writer's mind unless it's mine. So I'm mm -hmm. always a little bit uncertain um, about what I'm doing when I read other, other people's work. Fair enough on that. Yeah. And, uh, as a matter of fact, I think that you've appeared on some other podcasts too, you know, doing, doing some voiceover work and stuff. So mm -hmm. I, I think I've seen your name crop up. Do you do anything different when narrating your own work as opposed to when you narrate someone else's writing? No, it's the same process. I just, I, I, try to vaguely approximate the character with the voice. And then I really just let the, the words do, do all the work. Uh, I think if I could just be vaguely plausible as that voice, it's really the, it's really the prose that's doing it. That that's, that's getting inside your mind and creating the character. So I try not to do too, too much. Let's see, scrolling down here. Um, do do do. Are there any stories from Knife Point and Snowy Nights that you have trouble choosing where to place? Uh, I was thinking recently of um, I did a story called Bots, and for whatever reason, as I wrote it, it, it was very seasonally dependent. It was very calendar calendar dependent, and driving distances became very important for the timeline. So I had this big map of in the, the Pacific Northwest, this printout, I kept drawing on it and reworking and reworking. And I, I got so confused after a while that I just wanted to give up writing entirely. I'm like, I can't, I can't, I can't make this make sense. This can't happen because of this and that. So that one was a little bit difficult and anything involving like a real historical setting. Um, I wrote a story that was set during the Napoleonic Wars, Napoleon, N Napoleon's oh, yeah, uh, incursion yeah. into Russia. That's right. That yeah. was difficult because it's our old friend research. Like I have to do enough research just to make it plausible. I can't just get away with things. I have to go to some sort of uh, reference material. My God, the nightmare and actually, and actually take some notes that, that makes it a little bit, a little bit difficult. 
I, w- I would like to publicly volunteer as someone who majored in history. I will do the research for you. You just point me in the right direction and I can get you bullet points, reference notes, anything that you want. I love doing that kind of stuff. So, yeah, that would be so a this is probably, it's funny because I have this great yeah. college library near me. You'd think it'd be fun just going to the college library and just start doing the research. But for some reason, it just, uh, I don't know, just, just can't, can't seem to get enthused about it. I understand for sure. Now for the deepest question, what is your favorite dinosaur? And no, I'm not trying to be cute. I like the Triceratops and I will tell you why. Because you're getting, you're getting a full strong dinosaur experience. It's a big kind of creepy looking creature, but it's, it's a herbivore, right? So you don't have to run screaming. You can just, Triceratops, you can walk right up next to it and say, hey, how you doing? What's up? And then you can just kind of go your separate ways because, you know, you're, you're both busy, right? So I, I like that. I like, I like it. That it's kind of scary looking. It's going to give you what you want in a dinosaur, but you don't, you know, you're not going to die. You're not going to die. And you can just go right up, up to it. You could, you could probably pet it and it just kind of look at you like, well, I don't know what you're doing, but thanks. Yeah. My son's favorite. Uh, dinosaur is a triceratops and he kind of says the same thing and he says because and he goes it has the spiky plates and you know he can fight off the t-rex but he's just going to eat grass <laughs> so yeah then he's, he's going to go to sleep for the rest of the day it, it, it triceratops looks very lazy to me and i think i identify with that <laughs> you think you identify with the laziness that's awesome was it in jurassic what park in, was it was yeah. it a triceratops that 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 they came across that was kind of sick and lying on its side and just kind of that's like right, was, yeah. was that a, a triceratops that's a gigantic yeah. piece of shit yeah yeah power yeah, shit yeah. yeah that's right yeah that was him which i think that that was the triceratops only appearance in the first movie of jurassic park mm-hmm. of which there which there are what like six of them now but no, no, no there's there's more i think I mean, there there's 24 what, nine? actually <laughs> yeah, twenty four. Oh man, yeah. They have completely. But that was lost a great scene. That. that was a great. That was a great yeah. scene in in that movie, Triceratops scene. Yeah. You know what? If I could bring back like a prehistoric, you know, a creature, an animal, or something, I would want the truly giant lizards of the era right before the Jurassic period, like when you had these lizards with like the giant cells on their back. And you have these just odd shaped Mm. like creatures with like what looks like a saucer on top of their head. And, you know, you know, this was the age of giant dragonflies that were like yards long and giant salamanders. I I would just love to see something. Hey, let's go back about 80 million years instead of 65. Let's look at what the world, you know, what it what it looked like then and just the crazy stuff. Giant cockroaches. Exactly. um, yeah. yeah, like uh, that's you know, the 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 Stephen King story, The Mist. It's like that's that's you know. Oh that's, yeah, yeah, that that's stuff right. was, yeah. was hanging that's out. Right. Not so much the acid spraying, but um, yeah. just weird things with you know. One day, you know, we'll get to the bottom of uh, these these deep sea trenches, and they'll all be in there in some form. So they'll come back. We just got to dig a little bit deeper. Sorry about that. I think I had a little lag here. I will put a little marker here. But yes, I agree with you. Now for the last question, Soren, are you ready? Are we ready for it? What advice would you yeah. give to people wanting to write in a similar style to you? And what techniques help you develop your work best? I would say just read, read far more than I ever did. Uh, you know, every everything you read even every movie or tv show you watch can be can be so instructional if you sort of approach it um from a very uh, cerebral scholarly perspective if you really look at what's going on and i say that i tell people every time you you come across like a, a scene in a book or a movie or anything that really grabbed you like that was so amazing i just want to read that or watch that again and again actually i've had the biggest breakthrough moments in my life when i mentally whiteboarded why that scene worked so well for me really stood back, stood back and thought about like why what are the techniques that they used and then conversely what techniques would have failed that same moment where do people go wrong in what these people just did so well 
uh, when I began to think like more critically about the things I was reading and watching, I, I started to really make some some really strong connections, and I, I learned a lot in, in sort of trying to teach myself how to how to write. It took that it took that mental whiteboarding process to really begin to understand, and then and then then after that it was just muscle memory, and you start to learn to um, avoid the tropes, and then also I think um, be a harsher critic on yourself. Uh, than I have been, but don't let anyone else uh, try to change the way that you you write. No one can really know you as a writer, except you. So I would say be careful of that. But just yeah, reading is just everything. Just keep reading everything. It'll it'll slowly the good stuff will sink in, the bad stuff will sink in, but the bad stuff will educate your writing just as sometimes just as much as the good stuff. That's probably the best. You know, it, you know, advice for an aspiring writer. I've heard so. Soren, thank you so much for your time here tonight. I really, really appreciate it. Awesome. And you have Absolutely. a good one, sir. All right. You too.